Hi, it's Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. Also, always, 1776.com. Today is July 27th, 2024. Let's talk about Apple TV's presumed innocent. Spoiler alert here. We're going to talk about parts of the show. If you have not watched the show and plan on doing so, you might want to hold off on watching this video until you do. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let, let me also make a couple of points here. Um, I myself have had a couple of jury trials. I'm a divorce lawyer these days, right? Normally here online, we talk about true crime, actual cases. This is a fictional case uh, from a book written by Scott Turow. Right now, just let me make a few points here. The show is very well done. The lawyering is, in my opinion, excellent. I strongly recommend this show. Jake Gyllenhaal, who plays Rusty Savage, is convincing as a lawyer and has an excellent courtroom presence, including his body language that would likely impress a jury. His sense of command, his confidence uh, without coming across as condescending, his persona is excellent. It's convincing. His brother-in-law in real life, Peter Sarsgaard, is also excellent as the prosecutor. Right? Let me pause here and point out that I don't own any Apple stock at the moment. Right? This is not a paid advertisement. This is just a review. It's a positive review. Right? Understand, Peter is more rumpled than Jake, which makes him more effective as a lawyer. He is fact-based. He is less concerned about whether or not his shirt is clean and ironed than he is about the facts he's conveying and the evidence that supports those facts that he's presenting to the jury, right? Frankly, and we can disagree on this, one man's opinion, I thought he outlawed the defense. The trial judge is also phenomenal. Her conversations with counsel are crucial to the plot. She is mindful of the Constitution and of conducting a fair trial, but she's dealing with impossibly difficult personalities, especially Jake, who we come to learn is a bit of a narcissist. Let's just say Jake's courtroom persona doesn't fully represent who he is. Now, the case takes place in Chicago, and there is a political overlay. Peter Sarsgaard's boss, O.T. Fag Benley, is arguably, in my opinion, the best written character in the series. Because we understand he wants justice, but he also senses the personalities, the personal agendas, and is mindful of how all of this can play out politically. He has the big picture in mind. He is the voice of reason. It takes several episodes to realize that. He is the fly on the wall who viewers can relate with since, like the viewers, he's trying to make sense of all of this. But the best lawyer, Right? You've heard me talk about Jake's courtroom presence. You've heard me talk about Sarsgaard being very fact-based. The best lawyer is Jake's lawyer, the former district attorney. He is extremely cerebral. He has a great courtroom presence, but it's 
different than Jake's big city presence, right? This is the overweight guy who, again, has clothes that might have wrinkles, uh, but he, of course, is letting you know that some of the weaknesses aren't who they're representing themselves to be. And he's doing so in a folksy, homespun way. I'm just telling you that's a unique skill. Right now, what we're finding out is that Jake's lawyer, right, who of course used to be Jake's employer, this is the former district attorney, did not know that Jake was having an affair with the murder victim. In other words, this is the great lawyer who is operating with limited information. Right? He is trusting his instincts in making decisions. In other words, he understands. And the actor playing him is magnificent. Bill something. Look him up. But he understands that he doesn't have all the facts. But he also knows that he knows Jake. At least he thinks he does. Right? He knows Rusty Savage. And he believes that Rusty simply isn't capable of committing the crime with which he's been charged, right? Rusty's attorney is also dealing with health problems. A wife who doubts Rusty, right? She doubts her husband's client. And, of course, this former district attorney just happens to be the best lawyer in the courtroom with nuanced questioning and most importantly an older we are all just trying to figure this out persona this is one of the best legal dramas I've seen it is definitely a must watch understand you know I've watched many court shows in the past um, I've seen a lot of episodes of Law and & Order and you know, there's usually moments where I think to myself, you know, this is just not realistic enough, right? There's some court rulings where I think to myself, okay, some screenwriter thought this would be entertaining to viewers, but it's not remotely realistic, right? Here, it's clear that Scott Turow knows the law, right? Here, there's a lot more attention to detail and realism than you find in typical court shows. But, let's be critical. I've just recommended this show. I enjoyed it. Right? I was surprised by how well casted it was and how good the performances were. Right? But, let's be critical. It's not perfect. The idea that prosecutor Tommy Malto would be allowed to be the prosecutor on this case when he is the person who the murder victim asked not to work with when she was alive is not fully believable. It's fanciful. Folks, this is Chicago. This is a major city. It has a huge district attorney's office with several capable prosecutors. In a high-profile case involving the death of a prosecutor, the DA's office would not want to risk distracting a jury away from the facts by choosing as the prosecutor someone who the murder victim asked not to work with. The DA's office would not want the jury thinking that the murder victim did not like the prosecutor who is arguing the case to them. Also, the district attorney's office would not want the jury to believe that the reason why the prosecutor is trying to convict the defendant of murder was because of some personal reason or jealousy unrelated to the facts of the case. 
So, as great as Peter Sarsgaard is playing Tommy Malto, in the real world, in Chicago, a big city with a lot of prosecutors, right? This isn't small town USA where there's one prosecutor in town. No, this is a city of millions that has a huge district attorney's office. Uh, Tommy Malto would not be on this case, right? You wouldn't want the prosecution to be thinking of the victim, to see pictures of the victim, and then to think to themselves that she didn't want to work with the prosecutor. Let me also make another point here. Certain witnesses, such as the medical examiner, are repeat players, particularly in cities like Chicago. There are repeat players who would have testified in other cases, right? I'm going to make a guess here that this wouldn't have been the only murder case in the city of Chicago, right? If you're a medical examiner and you're involved in determining the uh, cause of death, the time of death, uh, you're accustomed to being in front of a jury conveying that information to them. I thought here it was a bit unrealistic the way the medical examiner loses his temper on the stand. Right, folks? <laughs> it, you know, professional witnesses really don't lose their temper this way. This would be like an expert witness suddenly yelling at people and, you know, not answering questions, rather yelling out thoughts in front of a jury, no less, where there is the possibility of a mistrial if the wrong thing is said. Right? I thought it was even more unrealistic that after losing his temper on the stand, making this murder case seem personal, that the medical examiner would be allowed by the district attorney's office to be in the courtroom during closing statements. Right, folks, you've got to be kidding me here. Right, I thought the medical examiner part of the presentation, let's say, wasn't the most believable. Let me also say this too. Rusty Savage's legal representation was also interesting. He had the former district attorney as his lawyer. Now that's a huge advantage from an optics standpoint to have a dedicated former prosecutor. Someone who is committed to fighting crime. Someone who has been elected by the people of Chicago in the past to serve as district attorney suddenly switch sides and serve as your criminal defense lawyer with everyone in the courtroom understanding that he used to be your boss and that implicitly this crime fighter believes that you didn't do this crime. That would be like having oxygen networks, cold justice lawyer Kelly Sigler suddenly appear in court as your defense attorney with everyone in court knowing that she's known you personally for years right Marsha Clark suddenly showing up in court as your defense attorney and then of course the court would hear that she used to be your boss and that she's known you for years Folks, the optics can't be better. If you're a defendant and the former district attorney is your counsel, you're thinking to yourself, wow, I cannot do better than this. Right? Many people in the jury, no doubt, probably remember the former district attorney running for office. They may read the paper, read local news, and they probably recall times when the district attorney's office was able to get convictions in cases involving 
you know, awful crimes that no one supports, right? The inference is that the former district attorney is still committed to justice, right? And of course, is trying to make sure his innocent friend doesn't get wrongly convicted. Keep in mind too, it's even bigger than that. As a former district attorney, that means that Rusty Savage's lawyer used to be the boss for the prosecutor in the case, Tommy Malta. Right, so this is like a professor going against a former student. Right, the former district attorney would be the person in the room with the gravitas. He's the person who used to have the others working under him, both his client as well as the prosecutor. Yet we're to believe that Rusty Savage at first didn't want, <laughs> didn't want the former district attorney to be his attorney. I thought that was ridiculous. Right? I did not think that was realistic. Right? Wouldn't you want the district attorney just so the judge would understand in making rulings? Hey, well, here's the former DA. And I have to be careful here in this case. I'm dealing with a prominent member of the legal community. Well, it gets worse. Mid-trial. Just imagine if this happened in the O.J. Simpson case, just to name a popular case. Mid-trial, Rusty Savage's attorney looks like he has a heart attack. Right? He falls to the floor. He's grabbing his chest. You're wondering whether he's going to make it. Right? By make it, I mean live. I'm not talking about make it to the end of the case. You're not even thinking about that. You're wondering whether this guy's ever going to get back to normal. Right? Now, folks, when something like that happens in front of a jury, someone has a major heart attack, they might die. Typically, judges will order mistrials. Right? Understand, this is traumatic. You're a juror thinking about a murder victim who has already been killed. You're trying to process the facts. Now suddenly you're wondering whether the lawyer you've been in trial with for days is going to live. That might impact your ability to process the facts. Right? Just imagine Johnny Cochran suddenly dropping down in the middle of the OJ case, shaking, grabbing his chest, needing help to leave the room. Then you find out he's no longer Rusty's attorney. Because of the medical emergency. Right? If a defense group is able to have any juror after that incident, Give an interview where the juror says, I couldn't even think about the case. After that, I couldn't even remember the case. I was just thinking of this man shaking in front of the jury box. An appellate court might say, hey, I agree. Right? This defendant's constitutional rights were violated because he didn't have a fair and impartial jury um, that was alert, that was able to focus here. Right here, we're to believe that the judge, after asking the parties whether they wanted to continue with the trial, <laughs> after the parties say, hey, we want to continue, we want to go forward, we're supposed to believe that the judge then allowed them to go forward. I found that part of it to be a little ridiculous. Let me also point out, too, you have another problem. 
you're in court you have an attorney granted there's a team but this is your lead attorney um, you have an expectation that your lead attorney is going to be the person questioning the witnesses um, you know that's how everyone's prepared suddenly your lead attorney has a heart attack right folks you might not have effective assistance of counsel after that right the best made plans have just blown out the window and of course the reason why you don't have an attorney uh, that you plan to have is because that person suffered a medical emergency that's on record right it happened in front of a judge the court transcript would reflect the fact that there's a pause in the proceeding it's a sudden pause and that this attorney appears to have had a health emergency right this is the kind of stuff that would be raised on appeal the argument would be from rusty savage were he convicted I didn't receive effective assistance of counsel because even though the junior member of my team attended meetings this is a murder case this is a complicated case involving the murder of a former prosecutor right and the junior member of the team likely might not have had experience in murder cases like this one right keep in mind the person he or she would be replacing would be the former district attorney well I didn't think it was realistic <laughs> that the case was allowed to go forward and that Rusty Savage would actually be allowed to represent himself under these circumstances let me also point out too that courts are very protective of children you know here in a murder case I was shocked that the judge would allow the defendant to examine the son of the murder victim right that that seemed odd to me to the lawyers out there in the comment section I understand Rusty uh, has a right to represent himself tell us whether you feel that part of this fictional depiction uh, would ever have been allowed to happen I believe the judge would have called a mistrial before that point um, but tell us whether you feel there's a possibility the court would allow this to happen right keep in mind too Rusty has been having an affair with the murder victim before she is killed right and the child is actually an important percipient witness because the child saw Rusty coming and going to his mother's house right let me also uh, say too that in the show and I thought they did a good job here the judge in allowing Rusty to be his own attorney points out to Rusty that he can't ask questions in such a way that he's testifying in front of the jury without being subject to cross-examination without him taking the stand now she agrees to go forward it's incredible after giving that admonition right rusty of course immediately starts asking questions in a highly objectionable manner where he's trying to give his version of events he does this to such an extent that the judge says that he has to take the stand right I thought that um, you know once Rusty started doing that I thought a mistrial would be declared in real life right uh, let me hear from the legal community here in the comment section of this video uh, your thoughts on that segment let's also give law enforcement some credit here and keep in mind we're talking about law enforcement in a major metropolitan area like Chicago right 
Um, a married man's mistress gets murdered. The murder has signs of an overkill. It looks like a passionate murder. Right? The victim is hit several times. The victim is then hogtied after being murdered. Right? I believe, of course, in a situation like this, where a married man's mistress gets brutally murdered and the murder doesn't look like it's done by a hitman. It's not like it's one shot and then the person leaves. No, the murder looks like a passionate murder. I believe, of course, the married man's wife is going to be a person of interest. Of course, the cops are going to check the GPS device on her car. Right? They're going to find out if the car has a GPS device, then they're going to check the GPS device. Of course, the cops will want to know if she had an alibi. This is especially true in a case where Rusty previously got into an altercation with a neighbor that was caught on film. In other words, there are neighbors in the neighborhood. These people don't live on some secluded farm area, right? This is an urban neighborhood. They're neighbors. There are cameras in the neighborhood, right? Rusty's interaction with this neighbor's caught on film, right? There might be evidence that the wife left the home around close to the time of the mistress's murder. Here, we're to believe that no such investigation took place. The information revealed at the end of the show regarding the wife's automobile should have been information already known to the police. Right, folks? She would be an obvious person of interest. Right? Her husband was having an affair with the murder victim. I believe Joe Kenda, whoever the person is, you know, they would not have a problem getting a search warrant to look at the wife's vehicle. But my biggest complaint with regard to presumed innocent, and keep in mind, this is a show I recommend. I love the courtroom scenes, but my biggest complaint isn't procedural, it's substantive. The plot is excellent in developing adult characters. The plot is only satisfying if we believe that both prosecutor Tommy Malto and defendant Rusty Savage believe in what they're saying. If Prosecutor Tommy Malto is wrong and Rusty is innocent, we'll buy that. If Tommy thinks he has the right man, then the courtroom scenes have gravitas because it's a prosecutor seeking justice for a murder against someone who the prosecutor believes did the crime. If Rusty was drunk or insane and doesn't realize he killed his lover and is in court defending himself because he believes he's truly innocent, we'll buy that. Because the emotion he's showing in court is real. The arguments he's making are arguments he believes in. Let's just say, and I'll try not to give away the ending here. Let's just say I can't buy the actual ending. It undercuts the entire series. It is worse than that. We found out in this ending that one of these men has been lying. And that the lying actually includes some of the statements made in court. So, somebody here is a fraud, and it's disappointing, right? Somebody here has knowingly said things in court 
that they know to be false. It's even worse than that. Because of the way the facts lay out here, you start to realize that this person's a monster. Because this person is prepared to do certain things, right, that, quite frankly, are harmful and traumatic to others, simply to further his agenda, right? So on a substantive level, the last episode was my least favorite episode. Right? I was hoping for something more satisfying. The last episode did not deliver that. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. In sum, I recommend Presume Innocent. I thought it was well written. Uh, I love the adult characters. I like how they pieced it together. I thought the cast was magnificent. Um, I thought it was very adult. Thumbs up from me. Right? But like everything in life, it has its challenges. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. Thanks for stopping by.